It's become the most popular route for smugglers from Mexico. It's just littered with camouflage clothes and backpacks. What it looks like to me is you're smuggling people up to Phoenix. Somebody's getting paid to transport these individuals. What do you think the Sinaloa cartel is grossing a year? In the billions. Just wanting a better life is not a reason for asylum. They can say, well, the gang violence. And my question would always be, why'd you leave your family behind? What needs to happen at the border? If you can believe it, we are just a week away from the 2024 election. And there's one topic that's got everyone from Washington to Main Street talking, the border crisis. Both sides agree that work needs to be done to secure our southern border. I wanted to see for myself what's going on down there. I've been to the Texas border in Eagle Pass. Now let's zoom in on Penal County, Arizona. This isn't just some little patch of desert. We're talking about 5,374 square miles of land right in the middle of the state. I bet you didn't know there's a super highway for illegal crossings down there. It's been nicknamed the Smuggler's Highway, right on Interstate 10, which runs through California and Arizona. It's become the most popular route for smugglers from Mexico. But sheriff's deputies in Penal County say it isn't just cartel smuggling migrants. Americans are being hired by the cartels, and they are offering a lot of cash per person to these young Americans. With a steady stream of high-speed chases, these load cars are killing innocent Americans. Here's what happened just yesterday. Tucson Sector Border Patrol apprehended more than 7,000 undocumented immigrants this week. They also stopped 24 human smuggling operations. You have four illegals in your car? Don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. Children as young as 12 have been detained for picking up migrants at the border. Our mother was T-boned at 115 miles per hour by a 16-year-old transporting four illegal immigrants. Now, the driver of the car was an American citizen paid to transport these people, correct? Correct. If the border was closed, this would not have happened. So the I-10 has become the smuggler's highway. That way we're looking for guns and money. This way we're looking for people and we're looking for uh, drugs coming in. They have stopped a load vehicle, which is a car carrying illegals. You hear people all the time say there's not an increase in crime among the illegal immigrants in this country. This is not a violent population. That's not true in Arizona. We've seen more assaults on law enforcement, agents, officers, troopers, and deputies over the last three years I've ever seen in my life. So this isn't a close call with you? It's not a close call. Right in the thick of it all, we've got Sheriff Mark Lamb. He says the drugs and people being trafficked through this highway are ending up in cities all across America. In fiscal year 2023 alone, Arizona had more than 775,000 illegal border crossers. Now that's a whole lot of people slipping through the cracks. And Sheriff Lamb is out there every day trying to wrangle this situation. This is the smuggler's highway. This is how they get people and drugs from the border, basically from Mexico across the border, and they will eventually end up on the I-10 and, and get their drugs and the people into Phoenix. So one of the ways they come in is obviously they get in a vehicle, they drive along the I-10. Another way is all this desert area along here just a few miles from here is an Indian reservation, the Tejano Nam Indian Nation, and there is no wall there. There's only three strands of barbed wire fence at best. So the cartels will actually push people through the reservations and they'll walk 60 miles on foot through the desert in camouflage clothes, trying to avoid detection, oftentimes carrying drugs with them. And I could show you probably 50 to 100 spots where it's just littered 
with camouflage clothes and backpacks and carpet shoes. They are shoes that go over their shoes and they have carpet on the bottom and it's designed so that it doesn't leave tracks and it doesn't make noise in the desert as they're, be, as they're walking through. And they're trying to avoid detection just from us and law enforcement, but they're trying to avoid detection from rip crews as well. These are other drug dealers and other traffickers of humans. And oftentimes they'll try to steal it from the cartels when they're bringing it in. Up until just recently, there wasn't a lot of punishment for somebody that had illegals in the car. We have since passed laws that uh, basically assisting or participating in a human smuggling organization as a driver transporting, you're gonna be charged with a felony. Because the cartels are targeting the, the social media platforms, inherently they tend to find more kids than adults. And uh, Cochise County, I think the youngest they've had is 12. We've had 14 year olds, 15 year olds, and the cartels do this on purpose. They engage youth because they know that if they get caught or they get charged, that the, uh, the consequences are a lot less for them than what it would be for an adult. And the majority of the people doing the trafficking are Americans. They're paying these kids or other Americans $1,000, maybe even more per person that they transport. So when you recruit a 14 year old, 15 year old, 16 year old to transport humans or drugs, not only are you putting that child at risk initially because they're picking up a handful of mostly military age men who you don't know who they are. You don't know if they're convicted sex offenders. You don't know any of that. So not only are they putting themselves at risk, you also run the risk of the child running from us. And you have a 15 year old or a 16 year old who is not gonna be a very experienced driver running at speeds of over hundred miles per hour. So it puts us at risk. So our job is to catch these people. And so what we look for are indicators that we've basically learned over time with experience, some of the things that you might pick out, um, temporary tags, tinted windows, the weight of the vehicle, how it sits. We're looking for load vehicles. A load vehicle means that they're carrying some type of load and the load is typically humans and drugs coming into the country. And the way we're going right now, towards Mexico, it's, it's gonna be guns and money going back to Mexico. You know, when you're looking for driving behavior of a load vehicle, you can look for a myriad of different things. You know, sometimes when they drive past you, they don't wanna look at you. They have a guilty look. Sometimes they um, are driving under the speed limit because they don't wanna make any mistakes. We're gonna get a stop on this vehicle can't really see because of the tinted windows. However, you can see how weighted down the vehicle is. So that vehicle would be a perfect example. Somebody grabs their car, their parents' car, their grandma's car. They drive down to the border, pick somebody up. You can see how weighted down the vehicle was, and it was weighted down because it had multiple people in it and equipment in the back. In this particular case, they're just a bunch of people going to uh, LA, a band going to LA to play some music. Anybody that comes across the border on foot or jumps into a vehicle, they're gonna come through this area of, the, of my county, and basically this becomes the, the last gauntlet they need to get through to be able to get to Phoenix. The cartels will oftentimes have two vehicles. One vehicle is the load vehicle and the other vehicle is the decoy vehicle. If they sense that we the police are getting behind the load vehicle, we've actually had the decoy vehicle almost run our deputies off the road to get our attention. We had a situation like that where a deputy was pulling over a vehicle it looked like they had a, uh, a chase vehicle or a decoy vehicle with them, traveling tandem. When we went to pull over the load vehicle, the decoy vehicle almost sideswiped my deputy 
when we found them, it was a lady with two kids in the car. One was a year and a half years old and the other one was about five or six months old in the vehicle. And she led us on a pursuit for almost 40, 40 plus miles. So this is very dangerous for us, but we're always looking first and foremost for the public safety. It is not easy. With the holidays around the corner, I've found the perfect gift to make your loved ones feel special, Cozy Earth. I'm wrapping my family in the ultimate comfort and sharing why you should too. A silent night starts with the right sheets. Cozy Earth Bamboo Sheet Set turns everyday luxury into unparalleled comfort, making every night a serene escape. For holiday pajamas, Cozy Earth's women's bamboo pajama set and men's pajamas are stylish, super comfortable, and ideal for festive mornings or lazy evenings. So soft, they feel like wrapping yourself in a cloud. What sets Cozy Earth apart? Their temperature regulating fabrics and 10 year warranty ensure these gifts last for many holidays to come. Wrap the ones you love in luxury with Cozy Earth. Head to CozyEarth.com forward slash fill. Use my code fill for up to 40% off. That's right, up to 40% off. How amazing is that? Just go to CozyEarth.com forward slash fill. And don't forget, if you get a post-purchase survey, say you heard about Cozy Earth from Dr. Phil podcast. What's your friend's names? Carlos, Maria, and Ana. We're being good friends, they're really not conversing. What it looks like to me is you're smuggling people up to Phoenix. And what were their names again? It's Maria, Ana, and Juan. Maria, Ana, and Juan. It's human smuggling. Somebody's getting paid to transport these three individuals. This is everyday occurrence. Sheriff Mark Daniels of Cochise County says in the last 31 months, there have been five to 600 pursuits coming through his rural county. Now that's just unheard of. I sat down with the sheriff and the vice president of Border Agent Council, Art Del Cueto, who says the media is not reporting much about Arizona's border issues. Art says he has solutions if anyone would care to listen. Well, I did. You've been a Border Patrol agent since the early 2000s, 2003, right? Correct. And you actually are from Mexico, but you grew up in Arizona, in Douglas, Arizona, right? Exactly. Tell me, how is the media doing on reporting what's really happening in Arizona? I think they're not doing a very good job. And I'll tell you where some of the issues are, is Arizona continues to be the number one area for encounters in the entire country. But you see a lot of what's happening in Texas because you have a governor out there that's willing to open up to the media and he's willing to allow other law enforcement within Texas to speak about it. And, and here, we just haven't had that positioning in Arizona. You know, you have very few individuals that are speaking about the issues that happen. You have uh, Sheriff Daniels here, obviously out here in Co Cochise County, which he's on the border. I uh, mean, he constantly speaks about the dangers. You have Sheriff Lamb further up north in Pinal that speaks about it. But other than that, you really don't have that much talk about it. Me, as the vice president of the National Border Patrol Council, I come out as much as possible when I say, look, we're having a lot of issues out here. Take, for instance, uh, in El Paso, when you saw the 300 individuals that knocked down that fencing and came through, at that same time, you had 3,000 entries in Arizona, but people wouldn't speak about those issues because it's not in the limelight, it's not being seen. Gotaways are a big thing. There's no telling what the number is of the actual gotaways because there's no one out there to actually see them. That's exactly right. And the terrain here is so difficult. And even with 3,500 plus cameras, uh, aerials, all of this, you, 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 it's not like you don't know what's going on. It's just you can't always get where you need to be to do what you need to do. And every law enforcement has their budget restraints. The federal government's the same way. We're dealing with individuals that don't have a budget. They can do whatever they want. And, and right now you're talking about, hey, the numbers have slowed down. Well, the numbers have slowed down in a lot of areas, but in the way the government has counted the numbers first and foremost, at the same time, you have a serious war going on just south here. There's a big war going on between cartels. There's been gun battles and gunfights each and every single day down there all along the border. And, and then I was recently talking to an individual south and I said, you guys got wars going on in Mexico. 
how do they afford it? Well, obviously they've afforded it because they've brought so many drugs and human smuggling into the country. Right now, one box of 50 rounds in ammunition in Mexico is going for $100 a box. Where are they getting it? They're getting it through here because they realize that, hey, you can bring uh, you know, 30, 40, 50, 100 people that creates the distraction where now agents are gonna have to respond to that area and worry about transport. And while agents are stuck in that area waiting for transport, you got all these other individuals going north, bringing in fentanyl and more you know, human beings into the United States. And at the same time, it's a free for all to also go south. The scouts bring people north and then they go south and they bring more people. Every time you see a car chase in Cochise County, the drug cartels know that you're gonna have a lot of resources at those events, and that allows them to continue to bring lows into the United States. And you say that gotaways are up 60% from last year so far? And that's just a guesstimate, but I've seen many a times where agents have been going after groups, and if they walk one behind the other, they wear carpet shoes, which is a piece of carpet underneath their feet, so you don't know how many people are crossing, and the common practice on the radio is saying it's 20 plus. Well, those 20 plus can turn into 60. You don't know, but the only thing that you write down as gotaways is 20. And all these battles that are going on in Mexico right now, is, is this a turf war? This is absolutely a turf war. You got several factions that are fighting, but at the same time, they need to supply their war by money. And how do they do that? By continuously bringing drugs and more people in the country. Yeah. It's been estimated that the, the Sinaloa cartel themselves work in over 150 countries worldwide. At the same time, CBP has reported that they've arrested people from over 160 different countries worldwide. The yep. red flags are there. What do you think the Sinaloa cartel is grossing a year? Oh, in the billions. I heard it was over $2 billion is what they, what they netted after all costs. It was still two billion, two point three, two point six billion $2.6 billion. That's why they're doing, it's a business. You're not dealing with the mom and pop shops. Look, I grew up in Arizona. I've been here my entire life. And I grew up in Douglas. And I remember, you know, seeing the loads that would come across. And, you know, back then, Border Patrol chasing these vehicles, you know, uh, sheriffs uh, out there chasing these vehicles that were coming across. And you would deal with pretty much mom and pops that were bringing, you know, marijuana across at times. You'd see cocaine and issues like that. But right now, you're dealing with these individuals. They've sent their children to American schools. They've sent their children to American universities and then they go back, they study business, and they run this criminal enterprise. Well, I was just gonna ask you, are, are they sophisticated? Because it, you know, we're seeing them use social media, we're seeing them do all kinds of marketing. If you could wave a magic wand and, and could do something to get this under control, what needs to happen at the border. You need to have the proper policies in place. First and foremost, you have to, uh, and you hear the word remain in Mexico. That's a big thing. If there's no incentive, the numbers will slow down. So what you need to start off right off the bat, if every individual that's coming into the country right now that are asking for asylum, you detain them. You stop releasing people. You don't just say, okay, you're gonna ask for asylum, I'm gonna let you go, show up whenever you show up. You detain every individual that's coming across. You utilize individuals like Sheriff Daniels that are willing to help, willing to put up their detention facilities to also detain some of these individuals. And once you start detaining people, the numbers will drop automatically because word gets out fast and they'll say, hey, if you come across, you can't just say asylum. You're not just going to get released. Now we're having to stay incarcerated until we can prove our asylum claim. The numbers will drop tremendously when you start doing that. What would you guess is a percentage of legitimate asylum claims of those that are coming across the border? You're from New York? Yeah. Who are these people? My cousins. Your cousins? Yeah. Oh, do you know their names? Yeah. What is it? Benjamin, um, Jose, and then I forgot the one who's from. Those guys got weeds all over them. They just crossed the border or something? No, no, no. Uh, have you guys been out rolling around in the weeds? No. We see it quite a bit where uh, people are recruited online, like through social media. This gentleman we just stopped with the illegals, he was actually from New York. He was definitely out here to work. I am very much in favor of immigration. In fact, I know we must have an influx of legal immigrants, or we could be in real trouble population-wise and economically. But no matter what your politics are, one thing we can all agree on is that the current border policies 
are broken, badly broken. What would you guess is a percentage of legitimate asylum claims of those that are coming across the border? Well, I'll use Congressman Cuellar's own words. He's a, he's a congressman out of Texas. And I believe he said that out of everyone that's asking for asylum right now, he believes that only 7% of those individuals have an actual asylum claim. This is Henry Cuellar? Henry Cuellar out of Texas. Yeah, I, I've talked to, to the congressman, and I think he's in a position to know. And so less than 10%. I think he was generous by saying seven. So if we're being honest, 90 plus percent of these people that are coming and asking for asylum aren't coming for asylum reasons. It's not, and asylum being that there's something behind that is so onerous, so dangerous, so threatening that they've got to escape to get out. And just wanting a better life is not a reason for asylum. Financial reasons is not obviously the yeah. reason. And, and even if you go that far and you go with a better life, you're seeing some of these individuals, and I know the term gets used often, military-aged men. That's what you're having. You're having individuals between the ages of 18 and 35 that are coming across, and they're leaving their family behind. And then they turn around and they say, well, the, the gang violence, the cartel violence. And my question would always be, why'd you leave your family behind if that's the reason you're coming here? If you're fleeing something and you're really in danger and you're really scared for yourself and your family, you flee with your family. But if you go by yourself and you leave your family behind in the areas that you're saying are so dangerous by gangs and cartels, then you're not fleeing from something, you're fleeing to something. And that's what's scary. Yeah, that is really well said because if, if they are the able-bodied male or males in that area, that community, that family, you don't leave the women and children behind to be abused, raped, killed, taken over whatever and flee, that's rather cowardly to do. Is. is this an economic play? I think it's a little bit of everything. It's, a, it's an economic play where, you know, they, they, want, they want to send some money back to their families so their family can be better off. But at the same time, you have criminal cartels and you have gangs and everything else throughout the world that have taken advantage of this and they realize, hey, this can grow our, our criminal enterprise even further because they continue to put people in the United States that they can set some kind of home base, continue to bring drugs into the United States. I was out with Sheriff Lamb earlier, and let me tell you, those guys are eagle-eyed. They're watching these cars go by, and they've got a, like a 10-mile stretch right. that don't have exit ramps. So they've kind of got them corralled in there, and they're spotting things in these cars going by. That I'm like, what? what? What was it you saw? And, and they're exactly right. And they're still getting away. Yeah. You still got people getting away, There's as they so said. many, I mean, uh, I counted one time in about two minutes, uh, there were like three, 350 cars come by, and there's like two sheriff's vehicles there looking at that. They spotted them. I, I mean, look at me, it's like a blur, but they're like. Uh. Dr. Phil, the reason our numbers, our stats aren't tripled is I don't have triple the resources. They're just flooding these highways, they're flooding the border, and they know we're outnumbered. We're totally outnumbered. And uh, those numbers of gotaways, the number of drugs that are being seized are nominal compared to what's really getting into the country. So nothing short of not really policy change, but just policy enforcement is gonna stem this tide. Absolutely, that's how you're gonna stop it. You, you have to have real consequence. When you have 16 year old kids coming down to, to south to the border from you know, good neighborhoods, and they're being promised $1,000 a load, or they say, hey, if you come through the checkpoint, you'll make even more money a load. They're being promised that. You, you got 16, 17 year old kids that are coming down here doing it. And at the same time, you got drug smugglers calling them and they're saying, hey, this time don't stop. Don't stop. You have to have law enforcement chase you. A lot of times it's because there's another load behind and they realize that chase is gonna divert the, uh, them and, and allow them to bring other. Dr. Yeah, Phil. so Chases. they're the rabbit. And then the That's one coming exactly behind them is the, yeah. Dr. Phil, I, I think it's so important. I say this all the time. Washington, D.C., Congress and the White House has to have the will to change it. And that's where it starts. If they don't have the will, which is the engagement, the acknowledgement of it and the prioritization of it, it's going to continue happening. They got to follow that rule of law. At the beginning of this administration, I heard a 12 year old boy from Guatemala come across and say, the reason I can come now is because your president said I can do it and there's nothing you can do about it. That's right. And he's right.
He's right. And that's what's unfortunate. Dr. Phil, can I say one thing that Please. I think is very important? America's sheriffs, there's four associations, major county, national sheriffs, western states, and southwest border sheriffs, along with Texas. We have made numerous requests to President Biden to meet with us, to talk about this, talk about community threats, the border. To date, he has never even answered us or engaged to even meet with us. And when we're not meeting with the White House, first president in modern day time that we know as sheriffs that has never met with America's sheriffs, that's where the problem starts. Yeah, We had well, members of the National Border Patrol Council tell Secretary Mayorkas, this is how you fix it. And everything has been ignored. Dr. Phil, we gave in El Paso, Texas, along with a dozen other sheriffs and myself, I hand delivered to Secretary Mayorkas a 16 point action plan three years ago. Sheriffs were asking, whatever happened to that plan? I reached back out to Secretary Mayorkas and said, Mr. Secretary, where are we at with this plan? And I, I quoted back, did you give me something, Sheriff? We've never heard a thing from us since. So that's why I'm talking. If you don't engage it, acknowledge it, and prioritize it, we're not gonna fix it. So. They don't care. Dr. Phil, this is the problem. I, I can't tell you how much I'm going to amplify what you guys are saying, because you're here you're on the ground, you're in the desert, in the dirt, and people cannot deny what you're saying. You got the videos, you got the pictures, you got the numbers, you got the agents here that are telling the same story. Thank you. We're gonna get this message out and we're gonna keep it out and hear it. Thank you. Gentlemen. Thank you, Thank Dr. you so Phil. much. Thank you. Thank you Good very much. You, Thank man. you so Thank much. You. I'm sure many of you have seen the numerous groups that are coming across daily. When the group of illegal immigrants come across the river, as they discard their clothing here, that's why you see so much debris. We're trying to prevent these crossings by placing razor wire to try to redirect those individuals to the port of entry. Our state troopers, National Guard, Border Patrol, they're working tirelessly right now. Again, they're doing great work, exceptional work. All the support you can provide to them will be very beneficial to them. Earlier in the year, I flew down to Eagle Pass, Texas. I met up with Lieutenant Christopher Oliveras of the Texas Department of Safety and Brandon Judd, the former president of the Customs and Border Patrol Council, and asked them the hard questions that you won't see anywhere else. I have put together those key moments from my time on the Texas border, and I want you to take a look at these. That's Mexico right there. These people that are coming across, how do they get from China to that side of the river. It's all coordinated with, you know, criminal smugglers in Mexico. Every person that comes across that river, whether they be an adult or a child, is paying a fee to these Mexican cartels. You're talking about Chinese people are paying anywhere from 35,000 to 50,000 a person just to get across. If you've got Chinese, you've got Syrians, you've got people that are clearly coming from enemies of the United exactly. States, and they don't have the money, then it's clearly being financed by somebody. Exactly. How many known terrorists have been apprehended in the last three years? There's been over 300. It would be naive to think that you've caught 100% of the terrorists. Yeah, of course, that's not the case. So if, if you've caught 300, then there may be 3,000 that, exactly. that are in the country. Yeah, if you look at the, if you look at based off the number of people that they have confirmed so far, you know, based off CBP, 1.7, 1.8 million known gotaways. Remember, that's just known. But if we've got 3,000 to 30,000 known terrorists that are in this country and we don't know where they are, we're not tracking them, we're not monitoring them, then we've got a threat inside this country. They could be scattered throughout the United States making exactly. some coordinated plan to act against the United States at a certain time. Exactly, exactly. We wouldn't know until it's too late. The barbed razor wire along the Rio Grande is at the heart of a tense standoff between Texas and federal officials. How is this battle of wills playing out here on the ground? Brandon Judd is the president of the Customs and Border Patrol Union. He says he works side by side with Texas law enforcement nearly every day. Brandon, it's good to talk to you. It's pretty quiet here today. It is. Uh, that's a good thing, right? It's a, it's a very good thing. Why is it quieter? It's because of what you're seeing right here. When, when Texas sees Shelby Park, the cartels recognize that this was very, very bad for their business. So they're gonna move the traffic based upon what's gonna be good for them. 
These children that are coming in that have addresses or phone numbers, somebody calls that number, right? We do. So if they're unaccompanied children, we'll take them into custody, we'll process them, we'll verify that their addresses are correct, phone numbers are correct, and then we'll turn them over to the Office of Refugee and Resettlement. And ORR will then ultimately place them um, where they're supposed to go. And when they come in with someone that says, I'm their mother, aunt, uncle, or whatever, we have no way of verifying that. We do not. And they're sent off to this number or address that is coordinated in some way. That is correct. And that could be a trafficker, it could be... We believe that oftentimes it is a trafficker. When you see these children and you know that there's a very good possibility that they're being trafficked, that they're going into the sex industry, that really affects us. So our tax dollars are paying to sell children into sex trafficking, paying to sell children into sweatshop trafficking. Essentially, yes. And, and we know that. We're, we, we knowingly are spending our tax dollars to sell children into sex trafficking. We do. There have been investigation after investigation that shows that a lot of these children are going into homes um, that are using these children for their own purposes. It's a monstrous life that we're putting them into based upon our policies. How under any theory is that okay under any administration, under any policy, is it okay for us to be spending tax dollars to traffic children? Because the American people just don't know about it. We, that's we, why I'm talking about it now. That's, I and, want and, American and, people to know about this. And that's why we're speaking with you and we're grateful for that. Look, it, it's when, when we hear about attacks on democracy, I believe that one of the biggest attacks on democracy is when our government fails to tell the American people what's actually going on. Well, am I saying it plain enough? You are, you are, and I'm grateful for it. This morning we're in Eagle Pass. It's been a very busy morning, just multiple groups of illegal immigrants coming across. The river level has been high. It makes it more dangerous in these situations for these people to cross. At times they do use children. They use them to cross through the wire, to raise a wire, because uh, then we're gonna have to accept them because there's children involved. They've been told not to cross, but they continue to do it. And that's probably the most challenging part. When I was at the Texas border in Eagle Pass, I met up with a U.S. Southern border expert, Jason Jones, who says human trafficking at the border is the largest U.S. intelligence failure since 9-11. I appreciate you talking to us. You got a handful of wristbands here, and I, I want to start by just having you tell us what these are. What Americans need to know is that what I'm holding in my hand here today is America's new slave trade. And I mean that to the very core of who I am. So this is debt bondage. In other words, if in the old days, the cartels didn't care where you came from, what country you came from. To cross that river right there was $100 on average. But when we got overrun, they said, we can send them throughout the country and we can keep them indebted to us for years, if not decades to come. So they began collecting what we call their personal identifying information. And once they found out their country of origin, where they came from, their mother's name, their father's, their home, their phone number, and then they figured out where they were going, they got a wristband. At the time when this started, it was $2,500 just for a Mexican citizen to cross, 3,000 for a Central American, 5,000 for a Chinese, and if you were Russian or Middle Eastern, nine grand. Well, these migrants didn't have that money and they knew it. And they began putting these on them. So now here's where we are today. They cross with these wristbands on them. And then we send them throughout the country. They spread a virus of debt bondage where these people for years, if not decades, are now indebted to a criminal organization in a foreign country who really should be a terrorist organization. So what are they doing to pay this off? So now this is where many of the women are gonna go into commercial sex. This is where many of the men are gonna become burglars, robbers, drug dealers, all to pay these organizations in a foreign country. The estimates are since the new administration, and I'm not political at all, I'm just trying to put a marker down time-wise, that six million people have come across the border. I've also heard that it's closer to 15 and up million people have come across the border. Where do you put that number? 10.5 million under the last administration. That's not a perception, that's not a feeling. Anybody watching right now can go to the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, look at the data on the website, and it'll show you. And then you add two million known gotaways to that. And one of the things I'm concerned about is you've got young kids that are coming in with names and numbers written on them, and they're getting processed on. 
we're actually using tax dollars to traffic these kids. And I think that's got to make people really upset. You know, through the natural course of time, all truth is going to be revealed. And when the American people see what has been taking place down here and all of the things you and I have talked about that they weren't told about was happening, yeah. get ready. Yeah. America's going to be stunned at what we've allowed here. It's not a U.S. problem. It's a global problem. But for the U.S., we got to deal with it here first. Well said. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Doc. You're probably asking yourself, what's it like living in this small town of Eagle Pass, Texas, when the border crisis is in your own backyard? Well, I met up with Kim, who says her family's cattle ranch was ruined, absolutely ruined by illegal migrants. Now this mother of two teenagers says she fears for her family's safety. My family and I have lived in Eagle Pass the last 16 years on a cattle ranch. We're about a mile from the Mexican border. We've always had an issue with trespassers, illegal immigrants coming across the border, but never like we have in the last three years. It's been very overwhelming. The biggest group they've caught at my house in a day is a group of 450. The Border Patrol told us that we have like most apprehensions out of like the whole state of Texas, this two miles in front of my house. These aren't just Mexican migrants. We're getting people from China, Pakistan, uh, Ukraine, Russia. The majority of the ones that we get from what I know from Border Patrol are the getaways that cannot pass uh, background checks. We found three different people murdered on our property. Last year, two were shot execution style in the head and another one was drowned. Well, right here is where the police uh, told me they found a woman who had been beaten and raped by 12 different men and is right here in front of my house. Immigrants that are raping these women, we found two different rape trees on our property. The rape tree is when they rape these women and they take their bra or their panties as a trophy and they hang it from a bush or a tree. One time, uh, my husband came home for lunch and found two men in the kitchen and he went running to the back of the house to make sure our daughter, she was 16 at the time, was okay because there's so many women that they'd found beaten and left to die. And when he came back, the two men ran out that back door right there and went into that field. Well, people that say that open the borders have no idea what's happening on the border in the first place. I'm scared for my kids and myself, and I'm not anti-immigrant. I want them to come, but I want them to do it the right way. Well, hello. Hi. How are you? Good. Have a seat. So thanks for talking to me. Oh, you're welcome. Tell me what's been going on, because you've got people coming across the river and crossing your property on a real regular basis, right? Yes, and there was some at my house last night. My dogs were going crazy. Oh, my god. Are they trying to hide? Are they running? They're trying to jump on the train. So like two days after Thanksgiving, this lady <laughs> jumped on the train, and she got her foot cut off and decided to hide in the back seat of my truck and blood there for five or six hours. Oh, my god. The train ran over her? Yeah, it cut her foot off. What do you say to yourself about that? I mean, because clearly they're intruding and trespassing and getting into your truck. But on the other hand, it is a human being with a foot gone. Right. It is, but I, I said I, I used to feel sorry for them all the time, but they cut our fence 77 times. You get frustrated. My husband makes a living by turning cattle out. We can't do it anymore. I've seen some footage of them on your porch, like ringing the bell. Yes, and that, that was 3 o'clock in the morning. I had left her sitting on the table, and I think they were going to break my window out to grab my purse if I didn't answer the door. And then I went in there with a, a gun to tell them to leave. Did they? No, they laughed. And they just said, we just wanted to know if you had a different kind of beer in, inside your house. We don't like this one you have on the porch. See, that's the problem. I'm sure some of these people have a legitimate reason for trying to get away from a bad situation. But when you've got people that are just violating human decency and boundaries, coming on your property, banging on your door, oh, yeah. that sort of thing. Th that's where people are saying, all right, it's time to draw the line. Right. It's they, time to shut the border. Yes. Well, what do you think needs to happen? I think they need to reinforce all the policies that they canceled. When Biden came into office, he canceled Remain in Mexico. There was one where if you got caught coming over here illegally, then you had no chance at trying to claim asylum here because you did it the wrong way. If you right. don't wait your turn, then you can't come in. So you just think they should start enforcing the policies and the rules that they have already, that they just suspended? Yes. Well, 
if you think about it, all these people, there's some people doing, like waiting a long time to get into this country and they're doing it the right way. And they're letting all these people break the law and they're putting them before them. Well, thank you for talking to me about this. All right, well, this. thank you, it was I nice appreciate meeting it. you. Thank you so much. What's happening down there in Arizona and Texas is really bleeding into cities all across America. It can be said that so many cities have now become border cities. It doesn't matter where they are geographically. Something has to change. And I hope tonight helped you in making your decision at the poll. I want to thank Penal County Sheriff Mark Lamb, Cochise County Sheriff Mark Daniels, Vice President of Border Agent Council Art Del Cueto, and all the men and women working to keep our border safe. Trust me when I tell you, this isn't a border agent problem. These are dedicated men and women who are working themselves to the bone. Thank you and good night. <laughs>